Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the graveyard shift. Um, so I work for a company called Source Code Control. We work with companies who develop software who use open source to manage risk. And that risk is typically uh, IP related. So uh, various open source licenses can impact IP value. We also help companies with security vulnerability management. Now, uh, this, this presentation is about an initiative called Open Chain. Has anybody heard of Open Chain? Probably, probably not. So I'll, I'll explain as we get into the presentation what Open Chain is about. So Microsoft, for instance, are a uh, platinum sponsor of Open Chain. But it's, uh, Open Chain is a reflection of the maturity of using open source to build software applications. Now, I'm going to start by talking about where it can go wrong if you do use open source in your software developments and you don't manage it. So I'll give real examples of security issues that have happened and also uh, legal cases around open source licensing uh, compliance issues. So when I'm talking about open source software, I'm talking about as you build an application, uh, developers will download libraries, components, maybe reuse code from another project. And when you deliver the code, it will be a mixture of your own proprietary code, third party open source components and libraries and frameworks, and maybe other proprietary third party software. So each one of those components has a number of attributes. First of all, there will be a license and there's various open source licenses. So documented, there's about 2000 400 documented open source licenses. Now each one of those licenses has different obligations and I'll explain some of those obligations to you because it can produce a risk in the code that you develop. On top of that there will be a version number which could be used as an indicator to see if there's any published or known vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities in that piece of code that's been used in the software. So this supply chain is called supply chain management. It's being able to identify and have a strategy for managing the use of those third party components. And that's what um, Open Chain is about. Now, the business impact to not manage open source can manifest itself in different ways. So part of our business, we do work for investors or companies looking for investments. We also do work where companies are divesting or, or buying another company. Now, it is becoming standard practice. If, for instance, you're looking for investments in your company and you develop software, there will be an audit of your code looking for the use of open source components and uh, what, how they're licensed and if they've got security vulnerabilities. And that can be used in various ways. It can be used to drive a better price better terms for the investments. Uh, we've seen investments fail, we've seen merged acquisitions fail because of licensing issues in open source components. Uh, you can be fined by regulators. I'm going to give some examples of the latest regulations in certain industries where you are obliged to manage the open source software supply chain. Bad, pu bad publicity. So I'm going to give examples of this as well. If you have a, a, a a breach, security breach, and it's caused by open source components. Obviously, that's bad publicity. I talked about copyright and license infringement. And you can also, if you misuse open source software, you can get a backlash from the open source community, okay, so, which again produces bad publicity. So to start with some examples, you probably were aware of a, a massive security breach that Equifax had just over a, a year ago. So Equifax do uh, credit, credit check-in, they've got uh, financial details on pretty much everybody in the United States and also uh, around the world. So that, that breach was caused by an exploit of two vulnerabilities in Apache Struts, which is a, a popular open source framework. So uh, one of the positive sides of open source is if there is a, a vulnerability, it gets fixed pretty much straight away. But if you're not tracking if it's in your code, then obviously you're not going to apply a fix. And that's what's happened with Equifax. So it's estimated it's cost Equifax $4 billion so far. It's had an impact 
on the US economy. CEO's lost his job. Uh, he's had to present to the Senate about what happened. Um, and there's been a report by the US government about what happens. So ineffective identification per detection. And what happened is when the Apache Struts vulnerability was announced on the National Vulnerability Database, so hackers get visibility at the same time as the good guys, if you like, uh, people start probing websites, hackers start probing websites looking for unpatched Apache Struts. They got into uh, Equifax's network and they sat there for 76 days, gradually siphoning off data. So all the records they had, financial records on each individual in the US. Um, there's a quote here from that report. So the former CIO, at the time of the breach, they didn't even know they were using Apache struts in their code. So if you don't know, using it in your code, you're not gonna have a strategy for managing for security vulnerabilities. And that story goes on. There's a, uh, a developer been investigated for insider trading, so he's aware of what was going on before it became public. So he shorted the stock, thinking Equifax stock is going to go down. Uh, so that's that's been investigated. Now the interesting thing about that, and this happens with other components as well. So this is when the uh, vulnerability was discovered, uh, and Equifax was breached. Okay, so it's uh, uh, March 2017. This is uh, stats from Sonotype, who run uh, Apache Maven. You can see the downloads for the insecure version of Apache Struts continued. So, so developers are developing, they've got a technical challenge using Apache Struts, not tracking the version they're downloading. So even after the breach is disclosed, 12 months since Equifax were breached, companies, individual developers, are still downloading the insecure version of Apache Struts. Okay, and uh, another company, uh, Alaska Airlines, also were breached through that exploit uh, a couple of months later. So um, that's part of the management of the supply chain. So Apache Struts will be one of those components that I talked about at the beginning. Closer to home, does anybody remember a, a vulnerability called Heartbleed? It's quite, quite high profile vulnerability, about four or five years old now. So Gloucester Council, in uh, around November, December 2017, were fined 100,000 pounds for leaking all their employee data. And that was an exploit of, of Heartbleed, which is a four-year-old vulnerability. Uh, and it's a vulnerability in OpenSSL, so a very popular projects for secure websites. So security issues are real, and there's regulations coming in mandating the management of open source and software in general. So obviously you're aware of GDPR. In GDPR there's Article 32, which states ensure a level of security appropriate to risk. So if you're developing software and shipping software, which has known vulnerabilities, so publicly available data says that's uh, vulnerable code, then obviously you're not taking appropriate steps. So you could find yourself uh, with issues related to GDPR. If you're in the uh, fintech space, so if you develop software solutions that involved transactions using credit cards, you have to be PCI compliant, which you're probably well aware of, PCI DSS. So January 2019, uh, the PCI Council have published a new standard. It's a secure software lifecycle standard. And in that standard, it actually explicitly states you have to be able to have an inventory of open source components used in the software. So you've got to be able to track, and I'll explain how you can do that in a moment. So you've got to identify all those open source components, uh, analyze if they've got security vulnerabilities, and have a process for remediating those vulnerabilities. Okay, so uh, if you're not PCI compliance, People like MasterCard, Visa may stop you, uh, you know, transacting with their credit cards. So we're seeing an increase in regulation around security. So the other risk I talked about was related to IP and licensing. And I mentioned there's 2,400 odd documented open source licenses with different obligations. Uh, in essence, um, 
Open source licenses fall on a spectrum of risk for a commercial organization. So at the easy end, is what's known as permissive licenses. Permissive licenses, the only obligation you have, so if you use third party open source components, there will be a license. And there probably will be a copyright statement saying copyright whoever developed the software. So the obligation with licenses like Apache, BSD, MIT, you may have come across, is that in your software application and in your code, you will give attribution to those developers whose software they used. So if you go into an app on your phone, like the Facebook app uh, and things like that, go into the settings or help about, there will be a list of third party open source used. Go into your browser, there'll be a list of third party open sources used. That is whoever authored that software, that's them complying with those licenses. So that's the easy end. At the other end, other extreme, there's what's referred to as copyleft licenses. Has anybody heard the term copyleft? Do you understand the term copyleft? So the term copyleft has come about because the authors of the license have uh, used copyright law to add some distribution terms which trigger obligations on the users of the software. And the reason why it's flagged as a risk, the, those obligations, you've got to do the license attribution like you do for the permissive licenses, but just using one component licensed under a copyleft license. So the, the most common or, or well-known copyleft license is GPL, the general public license. You are obliged to make your source code available to the user. Okay, so if your intellectual property value of your software or your company is based on the software, you probably don't want to share your source code. So just having one component can trigger that. So I mentioned we do audits for investors and the other way around. If they find GPL components in the code, they will say, we can't invest in you because there's a, a risk. We'll have to share our source code and the value of your company will go from that to that. The other obligation is that you have to license your software under the same license. Okay, so if you've got a proprietary license, your own license for your software, then you will have a conflict with the use of uh, GPL components, for instance. Does that make sense? So that's why they're considered a risk. Now, if you're in, in the, so we do work with the NHS, they've got an open source program called Code for Health. They actually want to keep code open to avoid being locked into suppliers. So in that scenario, that's a good thing. But if you've got value in your IP, in your software, it's a bad thing. Yep. Uh, somewhere in the middle of that, there's um, also a risk and quite amusing at times. There's uh, what's referred to as nonsensical licenses. So uh, this is a license that we're finding popping up in code. Uh, do what the FU want, public license. Um, so it's basically an anti-license license. So developers come up with this license, don't want to deal with uh, people like us or auditors. So just say, do what you want with the, uh, this software. Okay, so and it's quite amusing. There's a don't be, don't be a dick public license. You know, it's got things like, uh, if you become rich through modifications related to works or services, original work, share the love, only a dick would make loads off this, this software. So, uh, and again, they're quite amusing, but there is a serious side from a intellectual property side. So basically the risk is, and this is from uh, Google's open source policy site, which is in the public domain. This is a list of licenses they don't allow their developers to use. Uh, the do what the F you want public license cannot be used by Google. This license has a large number of issues. Lack of warranty disclaimer is one of the issues. So the common open source licenses like MIT, Apache, BSD always come with this warranty disclaimer. Now, if you don't state explicitly there's a warranty disclaimer, then you could be, uh, you could be at risk of providing warranties for that software that you haven't developed. So it's just a very, very badly written license. So although you might think it's amusing and it's an easy license to manage, actually it creates a risk in commercially written software. So how, does, how do these things manifest themselves? So th there's an increase in legal activity related to open source licensing. Um, so two examples, Harold Welt and Patrick McCarty uh, 
are contributors to the Linux kernel. So there's, at any one time, there's 15 to 20,000 developers contributing code. And it's all under the GPL license, which obliges you to uh, share any modifications that you do downstream. So Patrick McCarty, as an example, he's targeting large corporates who take the Linux kernel and will tweak and modify it to suit their needs. But large companies don't like sharing what they do with their competitors. So they're not sharing back what they're doing. So through German courts, at very little cost, you can issue what's called a cease and desist notice, which stops, stops you shipping your software while there's an issue, a legal issue in play. So he's going, he knows there's various issues with these modifications that these corporates are doing. And he's doing it to make money. So he will issue a cease and desist. The company can't ship the software or use the software that they've developed. Goes to the legal departments, what do you think they do? They don't want to go through a whole court process. They go, how much for you to go away? And they pay him a fee. Now he knows there's more than one issue. As soon as they settle on the issue, he goes back and says, right, let's talk about the other 15. <laughs> so it's estimated that he's made up to, in one case, 1.8 million euros uh, using that tactic. So he works on a part of the Linux code called NetFilter. And there's an email trail in the public domain where he explicitly requests that he's named as a copyright holder, which gives him the rights to uh, do that act activity. Okay. So what we find when we audit code for companies, we find individuals, contractors, developers, employees are putting copyright statements in the code they develop. So that will potentially put you at risk of them being a copyright holder of your software, your company software, and maybe in the future uh, driving some activity like this. Harold Welt does a similar thing. Other, other areas, um, anybody use GoScript or come across GoScript, it's quite a popular PDF tool. So GoScript is um, an example of um, how people make money from open source. It's under a dual license. So you can use GoScript in your code uh, free of charge, it's under the GPL license, which means you are obliged to share what you do with GoScript. If you don't want to do that, you can buy a commercial license from Artifacts, who are the copyright holders of GoScript, and they won't enforce the GPL, they give you a commercial license. So a lot of people are using GoScript, it's easy to download, and they're not buying the commercial license and they're not sharing back what they do. So now, Artifacts are going around auditing companies' use of GoScript and taking them to court if they won't buy a commercial license. There's a, another similar tool called iText. So we've got a customer at the moment. Uh, they use iText. One of their developers left, went to work for one of their customers and said they use iText and I don't think they're compliant. So they contacted iText and they're now auditing the developers of the software. Um, so that's uh, an example of some legal activity. With regards to the sharing of code, so this is a story f about uh, BMW. So there's about 100 million lines of code in an average car these days. A lot of it will be open source. So this is a BMW i3. If you browse through the media player, it's got a reference to open source. And if you want the source code, email BMW. So the story goes, a developer in Australia walked into a BMW dealership and said, can I have the code for that part of my car? And of course, he got blank looks, uh, escalated to head office. Anyway, no code was forthcoming. So these developers started making a noise on the internet about BMW not complying with the GPL. So eventually, they sent a DVD of the source code. So it's got components by Wind River, NVIDIA, so on and so on. And that code's been uploaded to GitHub and he's tweaked and modified it. Uh, but clearly, it took them so long to release the source code, they weren't prepared for the request for the source code. Um, so now, if, you, uh, if you're lucky enough to get a new Mercedes, you get a little CD, and it itemizes all the open source used to power that car. That will be them complying with, with 
the license obligations uh, with open source. Uh, similarly, um, Tesla were obliged to release the source code of their navigation system under pressure from the community. I talked about the community earlier. So everybody knew they were developing GPL licensed software based on Linux and they were obliged to share their code. Okay, so, so if you think about the software you develop, uh, would it be an issue if you got that request to share code and things like that? So there's, they're, they're kind of where it goes wrong. So I'm going to talk now about open chain and what the industry is doing to make all that stuff manageable and also an opportunity for you and your companies to demonstrate to your customers, partners that use your software, that you've got control of that and you're, you're not passing the risk on to them. So it will be a mixture of technology, process and people. So is it the responsibility of an individual developer to decide what licenses are being used? Uh, no, uh, but they should be input into the decisions. Yeah, that's a commercial decision. So you get management, maybe external legal, internal legal. There's technology. So SCA stands for Software Composition Analysis. So there's tools, I'll give you a couple of examples that will scan code and identify all the open source components, version numbers, how they're licensed, if there's a vulnerability. So there's technology, but the process is where OpenChain comes in. So OpenChain is a Linux foundation initiative, which and it will become an ISO standard probably within 12 months. So it's on a fast track to be an ISO standard. And there's a lot of, lot of big and small companies uh, involved in open chain, but it's how do you build trust in an open source software supply chain? And we're, we're, we're seeing evidence of purchasing people, so procurement of organizations, asking the question of solution providers, do you use open source? And can you prove to us that you're not passing the risk on to us? Otherwise we can't buy your, your solution. So open chain, you can get a badge that says you're open chain conformant, and I'll explain what that means. But it's building trust in the supply chain. So you can look at this two ways. One is we're defending against risk, but the other way to look at it is you're demonstrating to users your software, you've got, a, you've got controls in place to manage that. So open chain, there's a upstream, which is the components and libraries who also have their own supply chain. Um, so what's made, what makes up open chain is a defined process for managing the supply chain. There's a training program, so we've got a training course uh, based on that. Uh, and a, there's a policy in place that defines your use of open source. And the outbound is the software that you ship to your customers. Um, so late last year, Microsoft, who as you've seen today, are getting very open source. I used to work for Microsoft when Steve Barmer said Linux is a cancer, so it's quite, quite a shift, have become a platinum member of OpenChain. So they're adopting OpenChain in their use of open source. Other, other people involved, you've got uh, Google, Facebook, uh, the founders were people like Qualcomm and Toshiba, who, who all invested in managing open source, all have their own individual ways of doing it, but they've come together to try and standardize and document and publish that so everybody can adopt this standard way of managing open source. And what it boils down to is understanding your responsibilities. So I imagine if we went around this room, everybody would have a different perception of what you can do with open source and things like that and different licenses. Understanding your responsibilities. So that would be having a policy which your developers are trained on about what licenses are acceptable for a particular solution. So we don't want to share our code, so we don't allow copyleft. Ha you, know, uh, you can overlay security, so what is a vulnerability, what's the service level agreement. Um, somebody's responsible, or there's a team responsible. So some companies we work with create what's called an open source review board, which could be a representative from developments, representative from management, a supporter maybe, who, so if there's a, a, a component or a library a developer wants to use, 
and it's a license I haven't seen before, what do they do? So the idea is they research the license and say, yeah, that's acceptable, or it goes onto a blacklist. And then this review and approve open source software content is the software composition analysis. So can you identify in your code third party open source? So that's where these tools for scanning code come in. And when you ship the software, are you shipping with the right documentation? So the license notices, the attribution, if you're sharing code, you're doing that in the correct way. And you can demonstrate this to your customers. The final piece is kind of optional. So if you have developers contributing to community projects or you create a community project, are you doing that in a structured way? So for instance, um, some community projects like the big ones like Linux and Facebook who have open source programs, they make a developer sign a contributor license agreement, which hands over the uh, IP to the project. So if it's, if it's a developer working on behalf of a company, should they be signing that as an employee or as an individual? So it's having a structure around that. So that is the elements of open chain. If you put all those things in place, you can get a badge like that, which you can put on your website, you can promote as we are open chain conformance, which means we've got a policy, we can identify the components. So the idea is it's, you, it enables you to demonstrate to your customers you're not passing the risk onto them. Therefore, we're a safe bet. Therefore, you, you can buy our technology. So we've got a, a, so a 10 person company who we've taken through to open chain conformant. They're in the health sector. They just want a big deal. And they threw in this, we're open chain conformant. And the others in the, in the race didn't even know what that was, didn't know what a bill of materials was, and they won the business. So I'm not saying they win it because of that, but it contributed to them winning that business and they're only a small company. So the way that kind of works out as a solution, um, we, we call it continuous compliance. And compliance is, what, is whatever you believe you need to comply with. But in, in the theme of today about DevOps and so on and so on, so you think about a software supply chain, so developers using those components, and you're building the software, testing, and so on and so on. So you could be shipping with all those issues we talked about. So the next thing you could do is say, before we ship, we'll audit the code to try and find out what open source is in there. And if there's issues, we'll send it back and we won't ship. Now obviously that could disrupt a lot of things, uh, delay uh, shipping products. You'd have to take developers off the next release because we're fixing those issues. But we have worked with companies, the first time they look at this, they will say to us, will you audit our code? And I, I literally did this for a company yesterday, uh, and we found GPL components, security vulnerabilities. So it's better than nothing, because you're not shipping with the issue. But what you can do is start adopting these tools, which are referred to as software composition analysis tools, so basically code scanning tools. And this industry is like a, a growing industry. So Forrester, if you ever come across Forrester, like a Gartner, they've just done a report on the software composition analysis market. And there's various tools, the most popular ones, White Source, who Microsoft have invested in, and they use for security management. There's Flexerable, a company called Palameda. Microsoft use that, we use that for audits. So they use it to scan windows. And basically what these tools can do uh, they can give a report of all the components, they discover the components, uh, how they're licensed, copyright statements, security vulnerabilities, and suggestions on how to remediate issues. If you've got a policy, you can put the policy in the tool, and you can actually block a build if there's a, a, a component with a vulnerability or a license that you don't want to use. So you can integrate these tools into build environments like Jenkins, Azure DevOps, and so on and so on. So developers can self-manage and you can do an audit at the end. Uh, so that's uh, an example of white source. Uh, this is from uh, Flexera Code Insight, which was Palameda. Uh, so this is an example of what's referred to as a bill of materials. So if a company comes to us say, will you audit our code, we produce a report like this. So in this example, there's 52 third party open source components. Uh, 13 have got risky licenses based on copyleft. 
and there's 155 vulnerabilities. And if a company's never scanned code before, you find uh, out-of-date components which have vulnerabilities on vulnerabilities on vulnerabilities. So sometimes you get a high number like 155, but literally you upgrade to the latest version of the component and those vulnerabilities go away. And also, depending on how your software runs, doesn't mean to say they're exploitable, but at least you know in your code you may have vulnerabilities. So it else to be aware of uh, when you upgrade a component. Sometimes the uh, copyright holders of the component change the license. So it can work either, say, from a permissive license to a copyleft license or the other way around. So we had, we had a uh, company with two versions of a component. One was GPL and one was Apache. So version 1.1.6 was Apache and then, uh, sorry, GPL, and then 1.1.7 changed to Apache. So literally by upgrading the component, they wiped away the GPL problem, uh, but they weren't aware of it. So, so that's where the technology comes in. But then if you've got no policy, then how can you make a decision on what those tools discover? So the foundation would be a policy and this could you could have a overall policy for the company and maybe individual projects you have a defined policy and what it boils down to is what's your software doing how does it run how are you distributing and do you or do you not want to share the code of your software um, so what you you can't see on the screen but basically you end up with a blacklist whitelist and maybe a gray list so the blacklist, if you don't want to share your code, just blacklist every license with an obligation to share code. And then with the, with the software composition analysis, you can block the use of those licenses. So you can enter that policy into there. So what's in scope, how do you apply it, and so on and so on. So then you train your developers on the policy. So as you take on new employees, contractors, this is our policy for developing software, and they know the boundaries that they're working to. So what we get to then is what we call continuous compliance. So tools like White Source and Flexnet Code Insight, you can integrate in the dev environment. You've applied your policy. And as developers build and download these components, you can control the situation. So people come to us who are interested in managing this, always, particularly the business owners and the heads of developments, and saying you're going to delay releases of software. And you will do that if you just do an audit and then try to remediate the issues because it's disrupting development. But if you go through this process over time of creating a policy and integrating in the build environments and training developers, you can self-manage and avoid the issue in the first place. Yeah, so it's proactively managing it. Uh, that's why we call it continuous compliance. And you might have come across the term in the land of security of shift left. So if you heard the term shift left, that's basically shifting the management of security left into the beginning of the developer environment. So avoid it in the first place. Don't engineer the problem in. And also the cost of fixing these issues gets more expensive the further down that cycle you go. So if you've already shipped a product and as an issue, you've got to try and get that out to your, your customers. So I mentioned uh, some of the supporters of, of um, OpenChain, people like Arm Holdings and Qualcomm. They go down to the individual file level and line of code looking for uh, plagiarized code. Because you imagine if they got code on a, on a chip, which is in everybody's mobile phone and there's an IP issue and they've got to try and remediate that, that will just break their business. So um, we've, we've had examples of developers wanting to use a component and they strip out the copyright statements and the license to get around a, a, a policy. So what people like Arm Holdings do is they look for plagiarized code and they look at the patterns of code and you cross-reference it against known components and you say, there's a 90% probability that that code snippet came from that component and you investigate it and you say, well, we can't use that. So literally they spend a lot of time pre-releasing their software. Now, obviously typical software, you don't have to do that. But um, so, so when you've got that in place, 
you can have the open chain badge. We've got a policy, we can identify the components. If you have to be PCI compliance, you can identify the components you've, you've addressed that issue. So it's all about what's in your code. And that is basically um, what I was going to talk about. So um, we're a partner of Grey Matters, so we provide our services through Grey Matter. We've got uh, training programs, so we call it Get It Right with Open Source. Uh, we've also got a Secure by Design training course. We've got tools, so the tools I showed you, we've got those up and running. Literally, you could give me code now and I could give you a report in 10, 10 15 minutes probably of, of, you know, basically this is what's in your code. So we could do code scans if you wanted a proper audit, we can do that. Uh, we've taken various people through Open Chain. We've got case studies from my colleague Paul's. Oh, in fact, they're here. So we've got a case study with the NHS. Uh, we've got a little FAQ on the different licenses. Uh, feel free to take those. And we've got a, um, an online self-assessment for Open Chain. So if you're curious to know about how you'd stack up against Open Chain, you can just go through this questionnaire and it explains all the questions. You know, have you got a policy? What does that mean? and we can give you a score at the end and some advice and guidance. So all those things can be free of charge. Obviously things like intellectual property is a sensitive issue. So, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations are probably the best thing. But does anybody have any, any questions or comments about what is yeah. Yeah. I, I, You might have answered this and, yep. and I blinked. Yeah, that's all right. It might have been there. And it's slightly off to the side. Everything you say about using open source code makes complete sense and is suitably frightening. Um, but the one that's always worried me more is there is a huge volume of open source code out there. Yep. Um, and I've spent the last 40 years writing code yep. from scratch, yep. is it largely yep. uh, from scratch. And there are only so many ways that you can solve some problems in a, in a common sense way. What's the vulnerability on independently writing code which by some magic means matches um, open source code and therefore through these mechanisms uh, triggers all sorts of legal problems. Well so, so th 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 you get into the world of copyright law so we, we cover this in our training course copyright as soon as you start coding you're creating copyright right so uh, copyright law is based on books and works of art but it applies to code. Now you could have um, two developers, say a developer in Japan and a developer in the UK, start coding and without seeing each other's work, coding exactly the same way. They, they both got rights to that copyright. Uh, but if, it were, if the person in Japan saw my code in the UK and said, you've, you've plagiarized my code, I'd have to prove I've never seen his code or vice versa. Um, but that, the chances of that happening are pretty slim. But as I said, we have seen situations where people have taken out copyright statements. Uh, so the way it's managed, so what, one of the tools that I mentioned that we use for audits, they've got a massive database of code. They constantly trawl GitHub, NuGet, and places like that for the latest code. And then when we scan code, it takes a long time to do this, but it does pattern matching and it gives a probability based on four different algorithms about the likelihood of that code being from that component. Um, how, how big are the code chunks to the other part? Some of them are 100 lines of code, and yeah, some I mean of them are quite complex. If you take something like uh, servicing a, a serial UART or, or whatever, there are only so many ways you can yeah. write that. But I put a quote in actually, somewhere in there, about writing codes out, borrowing codes in. So the stats are the average modern applications, not rewrites, but starting from scratch, 80-90% uh, will be third-party open source. And that's one of the benefits of open source. All I'm saying is, I'm not saying open source is bad, it's the right thing to do. I'm just saying it has to be managed just as much as other software needs to be managed. And all the stuff I talked about, is, if you're new to it, it sounds overwhelming, but you can automate all these things. You can get alerts, you can integrate the tools into your into your code and train your developers. So it can be automated, so it's not as complicated as you uh, made the impression of. The, the other, just, you made me think of another area.
which is a blind spot for people. When you, um, a lot of people use packages and package managers, uh, you know, like NuGet and uh, Maven. So when you, in your codes, you use those components. If you just scan the source code, then you've got a picture. But when you build the software, it pulls in dependencies. And those dependencies, each of those dependencies will have a license, potentially a vulnerability. So we can do dependency scanning. So based on your source code, we can see the dependencies and build a picture of when you compile the code, what's going to come in. Or you can scan the built code as well. Um, and there is, a, there is a story about nothing to do with compliance or security, but last year, or well, the year before, uh, one of these packages, a developer had a tool in there, uh, I think it was like, like a uh, calculator or calendar function, and decided he didn't want to share it anymore. So he removed it from the package and software around the world started breaking because he removed the package and nobody knew what was going on because we weren't tracking dependencies. So having that visibility of dependencies is useful in other ways as well. Yep. 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 Yes. So we've had those issues, and that's that's where a policy comes in, which feeds into HR. So if you've got if you've got no policy that says you, that developer can't do that, then like I said, we've seen developers put copyright statements on code they developed while working for a company, and then go to a company, another company, and use the code. But nobody said he can't do that, or that she can't do that. Therefore, you got no leg to stand on. Well, yeah. So, so what? So the, what you do? So, the, and the big open source projects do this. I mentioned this term, contributor license agreements. So uh, in your employee contract for developers or contractors, you say, this is our policy. Any code that you write while you're employed, either under contract or permanence, is the intellectual property is with the company. And you have a copyright policy where you clearly copyright. So copyright 2019, grey matter, uh, and you don't have that issue. But if you don't, explicitly say that then you get that situation the other one is with uh, outsourced development so company x outsources some development to software house um, you believe it's your intellectual property but you haven't explicitly stated that and then they go to your competitors and do some developing for them so we're doing a, um, a project with a big pharmaceutical company and we found 96 copyright statements from an outsourced development and the head of development said we don't use that outsourcer and the lawyers are all, all over it as an issue um, you know so it's about having the, the policy in place in the first place yeah. I mean I get the gist of this and thank goodness I haven't got to get involved with it <laughs> it sounds to me a nightmare and some gentlemen over there said you know that so many things are just a way of doing things and yeah. in fact compilers force on you yeah. a way of doing things you can't really put a different yeah. syntax into your yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. just because you like it and you want to be a bit different you know we'll promote it yeah. you can't do that now my, my point is overall this is all very fine for a larger company yeah. but to me for a small startup yeah. it smell, spells money and cost yeah. um, now if you're trying to start up as a, a small company yep. and get yourself established, yep. can you sort of, is a copyright clause enough and the yeah, so numbers, is that all so you I, I, you So I mentioned the smallest company, so we've taken a company through the open chain, they're a startup and um, they've got, now got 10 employees including their management, so a handful of developers, they've developed their first application and won the first piece of business. Um, I said, if you're new to it, it feels complex. A lot of this stuff can be automated. Uh, there's advice and guidance. But when you're in startup mode, 
uh, and investors invested in startup companies don't even care about this stuff. The trouble is uh, when you get to this next stage where second round of funding or you're getting bigger, you might have you might have a, use some of that investment to basically recode, and some companies do that. So if you're a startup, open source is great. You, you reuse, da, 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 get to get developing quickly. Uh, it's only when you get bigger and bigger you might have to undo some of that stuff. Yeah. These code scanning tools, uh, are there some nice free ones that are open source? There are, there are open source ones. I'd say it's still an immature, immature market. So for licensing, there's a, a project called Fossology, so free open source softwareology, uh, which identifies the licenses. There's some free security ones. Um, and some of them aren't that expensive either. Um, there's ways to get free scans, but if you want to continuously be scanning and get alerted, then the way to go is commercial. But yeah, there are some free ones, yeah. Um, so I, I, I did put up a, um, it, uh, I'll give you a little, uh, so we've, we, we use a lot of these tools and we've evaluated a lot of these tools. Uh, White Source is very strong on security. I said Microsoft have invested in it and they partly use, use it. Synopsis bought a company called Black Duck Software you may have come across. We used to partner with them. Uh, they've gone down the security routes. Sticker security focused. Sonotype, so I mentioned Equifax. Um, uh, they, uh, Equifax use Sonotype now. Flexera bought a company called um, Palameda. So we use that for auditing. It's very strong on copyright and intellectual property. So it depends what's wh where you're at and wh what's strong for you. Uh, some of these tools are free to use in certain scenarios. Um, White Source has historically been quite cheap. It's for small companies, they license on number of developers, contributing developers. So if you're a small software team, actually they're not that they're not exorbitantly expensive. What, Synopsis and Black Docker are really expensive now, so they kind of price themselves out in the market. Um, we we run um, we run a, a service where you don't buy the tool. We've licensed tools, and so we can do it in a cost-effective way, which we did for the small company. Um, yeah, but it, you, I think you get a copy of these slides. It was, this will give you a view.